those of you attending, that is Lynn Finnegan, our experiential education coordinator, who is here to make sure everything everything works as planned, um, and uh, which is a good thing because, as as some of you heard, my my morning is off to early, early, already off to a, a wonderful technical start. But anyway, um, welcome to the career day. I'm glad you're here. It's a really necessary thing to be at a career day at this time of year in any year. Uh, but uh, for this year, especially, um, we need all the avenues, we need all the paths, we need all the help we can get. And uh, we've got three guests today who are uh, really uh, amazing people. And uh, we're very proud to have them here with us. And we look forward to hear their stories. So I'm going to get to them uh, right away. Uh, in the uh, order that they are on my screen, uh, we have Alexandra Burke, a designer who is at Merrill Diamond Limited and uh, for Susan Graver at QVC. And I'll let them introduce themselves uh, in a moment. Uh, the next on my screen is Joe Rotondo, who is the founder of Rocky Clark. And uh, some of you may have seen, seen him before because he uh, attended TMD night with us a, a little while ago. And then we have Christine O'Dell, who is at Gabe. And uh, we'll let them uh, explain what that all means. So uh, what I would like to do today is uh, we'll do a quick introduction round, just a couple of minutes for each of our guests. Uh, then I'm going to get into a little more detail and um, just do another round. But before we start, I'd like to ask you to take care of two protocol issues. Uh, th this is old hat, you're used to this by now. Uh, let's make sure that everybody is muted until they speak. Let's be patient with people who forget to unmute when they should speak. And uh, let's uh, make sure that, um, well, make sure I would recommend uh, having your view uh, at a speaker so that whoever is speaking fills your screen. That makes for a much nicer engagement. And uh, anyway, so here we go. So let us start with uh, Alexandra, or I, I do believe you like to be called Alex. Is that yes, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, either or. I guess I should go by Alexandra. It's very professional. Um, well, well we, we, it's career day. Would you please yes, it be is professional? Career would, day. You, yeah. would you be professional, please? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so my name is Alexandra Burke. I am a URI alumni and I graduated in 2010. I have worked in the apparel industry for almost 11 years now, which is like insane for me to even say. Um, and I have worked in mostly women's wear. I started at, um, I did an internship right after graduation at Lee and Fung for a brand called Rousey. And then I went to Ann Klein for about four years. And then I switched over to children's wear for a few years at Ralph Lauren which was super interesting. I mean, the mannequins are like this small and uh, it's definitely an adjustment. And then now I'm at a brand called Susan Graver. It's a privately owned company called Merrill Diamond. And we own um, a few different QVC brands. So Susan Graver has um, been around for almost 30 years. It's a very interesting time to be working for a company that was only really sold on TV and online. We don't have any brick and mortar stores. So we've actually done pretty well during this time. Um, and it's a very interesting time to be in apparel. So I know that everyone else, all the other speakers will definitely speak towards that as well. Um, but uh, people have had to adjust um, in this, this switch of COVID, very virtual world that we're living in. And um, yeah, I love it. I mean, it is a true passion. Um, you know, obviously some days are tougher than others um, and more exciting than others, but it's the best. I mean, we all need clothes, so. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that's uh, Dr. Bide's uh, favorite line. I'm glad to see everybody wearing clothes whenever yes. he shows up on Zoom now. Yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. Joe, what have, you, what have you got for us today by way of an introduction? Yes, I too go by Joe, um, as opposed to my more professional name, Joseph. Um, yeah, so I grew up in a little farm town in Warwick, New York. Uh, went to URI for the beach. Um, started as an exercise science major, but moved to TMD, um, which was, you know, the greatest decision of my life. Uh, while I was at URI, um, I studied abroad in Florence, where the idea um, an inception of Rocky Clark came to be. Um, 
what started as, you know, a passion project and sort of a hobby um, blossomed into what it is today. Uh, and I current, currently reside in Brooklyn, New York, um, where I have wonderful access to the garment district. And uh, yeah, it's a very exciting time to, to be in, in fashion and clothing. And, you know, we're just sort of starting to see um, the future starting to happen. So thanks for having me, everybody. I'm excited to, uh, to you know, tell our stories. That's great, Joe. Thank you very much. And I, I will mention to our audience before we get to Christine uh, that uh, we are hoping that our guests today will uh, uh, mention their LinkedIn accounts or, or other ways in which you can get in touch with them at a later date. Uh, so Christine, how are you this morning? And let's let's Hi, hear good. your story quickly. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Christine. I also do go by Chrissy. So uh, that is, I guess, my professional name these days, even though my signature does still say Christine. Um, I graduated actually URI in 2001. So I go back a little further. Um, right, you know, while I was in college, I, I did some internships in the city. I worked for Holston Couture, um, more in the licensing field there. Um, which I thought after the, my three months there, I would go into licensing. So there was a lot that I, I didn't know back then. I mean, nothing wrong with licensing, just that I didn't know um, all the different avenues uh, that merchandising could take you. Um, after graduation, I actually uh, started my career in the garment district as well um, for a junior girls company. I worked in sales for two years. So to me, um, even though I knew I ultimately wanted to get into buying, I didn't originally get into one of the uh, big uh, kind of buying program. So I worked there for two years. I gained a lot of experience just learning what buyers do, learning the vendor side, you know, how the production works, how the product gets to the US. Um, after about two years, I was lucky enough to get into the executive training program at Bloomingdale's. So that's really where I started my um, buying career. And that's kind of like a three to four month, you know, kind of a um, training program where really you're kind of floating around the buying office and learning um, the different aspects, learning all the different programs. Cause you know, as product driven as buying is, it, it is a lot of uh, computer work, a lot of Excel. You're kind of a mini accountant on the side trying to run your own business. Um, and basically at Bloomingdale's, I was pretty much in the ready to wear ladies division for the for about eight years that I was there. Kind of worked through the assistant buyer program. Um, then in their uh, career path, you go into planning. So I was in planning for five years. So that really gave me uh, a very well-rounded um, experience as far as the product, but also really, you know, how are you gonna be profitable in your business? How are you gonna get the margins that you need? And ultimately, you know, that's all what we're trying to do as buyers is, you know, put up the numbers to, um, to be successful. Um, after my stint at Bloomingdale's, I was there a little under 10 years. I went over to Raw Stores. Um, so that was really my first experience as um, an off in the off price sector, which is completely different and and the same in the same in the same respect. Uh, I went from buying uh, working in the Chanel and the designer to uh, negotiating like three dollar tops. Um, but I love off price. I, I feel like uh, so much of you know the industry is going off price. You know that's a good and bad thing for um, you know depending on what field you're in, but I was at Ross. I started as an associate buyer there. Um, I actually worked for their sister store mostly at Dee Dee's Discounts. Um, we had 76 stores when I started. When I left there after about 10 years, we had about almost 300 stores. Um, and it was a great experience. So I ended there as a DMM over uh, dresses and then for a little bit in uh, ladies outerwear and swim. And for the last two years, I've been a VP DMM um, at a smaller privately owned uh, store called Gabe's. It's uh, out of West Virginia, Morgantown, but we have a buying office in New York, also in the garment district. Um, so there I just oversee all of ladies apparel. Um, so very similar to what I did at Ross, but uh, we have 110 stores right now growing to uh, 120 this year. So it's a very exciting time. Um, in my opinion, to be in, to be in, especially the off price, you know, considering I've been doing this 20 years, right now is the best my business has ever been. So um, even though COVID definitely affected it in uh, negative ways, it's also been a, a big positive for me and the business that I'm running right now. 
Well, that's that's great to hear, Christine. I, I'm, I'm first of all very very happy to hear that, <laughs> and and secondly, I'm, I'll be very interested to hear more uh, in the next round about that rather amazing uh, growth and what that might mean for students coming into into the uh, world. Um, well, speaking of coming into the world. Um, what I'd like to do now is I, I had the pleasure of talking with our three guests uh, a few days ago, and uh, each of them had some rather specific thoughts to themselves uh, or about themselves and about their career paths and about their views of the world. And what I'd like to do now for a couple of minutes with, with each of the three of you uh, is just kind of go back to that conversation and just remind you of a few thoughts that you presented to me there, which I thought were very interesting and I, I believe will be equally interesting if not more so to our students. Um, once we've done that round, uh, I'd like to do one more round before we get to student questions uh, where we might preempt their questions by, by seeing what you might think is uh, good advice for them at this point. But, but let's start with the uh, initial round and, and I'll go the same path. So we'll start with you, Alex. Um, so when we spoke the other day, yeah. um, you, you, you had quite a bit to say about the path you took, right? how you got to where uh, you are, and you've described that now for us, but tell us a little bit more about that. I think it would be very interesting for our students uh, to hear about that sort of, uh, I'm missing the right word now. I almost want to say random, but that's not exactly what I mean. But yeah. I think I think you know where I'm going yes. with this. So, so yeah. So when we were talking, Carl, I was kind of comparing the apparel industry to almost like medical school. You take your four years and you're learning your general education on the medical field or the fashion world. Like you at URI, you're learning about textile science, merchandising, design, and buying. Then after you graduate, you know, it's also important to take those internships in school um, to kind of just see what's out there, get some of the lingo, but like not sure where you want to go. After you graduate, you kind of get into your residency. So you're trying to figure out what kind of path you want to go on. Do you want to be in menswear? Do you want to be in women's? Do you want to go to children's? Do you want to be more of a buyer? Um, so those years are so important to take those internships you know, take the assistant buyer jobs. And it's okay to say, you know what, this is, this is really not the right job for me. I'm going to switch over to men's or whatnot. And by about 10 years in, eight to 10, after being, you know, an assistant associate, then you're at a designer level, you kind of hit your fellowship. So at this point, you are comfortable with what path you're at, like I love women's wear. For me specifically, I love doing women's knitwear, but I also do wovens, bottoms, all these different things. But knits are really my niche. And at that point, that's kind of your guided career. And for me, you know, it it's important also to get a, a full range of experience. I mean, to be a design director eventually, it's important to have experience in all aspects of you know, the buying, the selling, the design aspects, the testing. So it's important to be a sponge, um, but it is a path and you have to kind of realize in the beginning and be mentally prepared that this first few years are a little tough in a sense that you have to put the time in. Same thing with medical residency. I mean, not the same, like we're not saving people's lives, but I mean, Clothing does that to people sometimes, you know, it, it makes you feel good about yourself, but, you know, it's important to know that you really have to put in the time and the effort and really be a sponge and really feel like, you know, I'm going to take in as much information as I am, even if I am, you know, exhausted. It's so worth it because you become just so much more experienced and a better coworker, a better employee for the company and a more, a better asset. Thanks, Alex. That, that was really, really excellent. And, and um, I'm extremely, extremely good view into that, that moment of, of being in the world and going, oh, my goodness, right. what have I gotten myself into, right. you know? Well, and, ooh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Ooh, sorry. Wait, all right. <laughs> um, 
And it's important to like, Joe actually was talking about this right before we all went on. The lingo is so important. Like, you know, you learn the general terms in school, but there is certain lingo that when you're in an office, you really don't know until you're working full time. Mm -hmm. And getting that lingo down is so important too, so. Okay, I mean, again, why, why an internship would be important. Right. Uh, so we'll get to Joe in just a second. Can I remind everybody please to be on mute? Uh, somebody's background noise is, is coming, coming in pretty strong here. Uh, so Joe, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, kind of segue off Alex here. She 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 invited invited the perfect segue for you actually because when we spoke, you actually went down a more personal road. Or rather, let's let's call it. I mean, obviously, all of your roads are personal. Let's call it a more introspective road. That's so, right. Well, let's let let's hear about that a little bit. Yeah. So. Uh... Thank you, Alex, for sharing that. Um, that was a great analogy, honestly. Like, it sort of put a lot of things together for me. Um, but yeah, everything uh, I do in terms of Rocky Clark is super personal, and it's really a true re reflection of like my journey, my experience, and what's happening, what has happened to me in the past, and what's happening to me, you know, right now. Um, but honestly, yeah, Carl, like you said, clothing aside, um, I've, I've been really trying to this past year, um, you know, reflect on how I work best, um, you know, and that that coming with that is like, what what are, what are some things that, you know, um, that I'm worried about in my days? um and how to really master my days to be the most um efficient productive and thoughtful through through each of my days um what, what brought so this I've been, on what brought this on joe what was the trigger for this it the trigger was was you know running your own business you got to wear a ton of hats and there's just so much to get done it's you know, there's 24 hours in a, in a day and you could really work 24 hours if you choose to, because there's just so many, you know, little things. There's always work to be done, always. And that really started to bother me and that really started to weigh on me where um, it got to the point where I would just have this extensive to-do list. And um, there were days where like, yo, I don't, I don't want to do anything today. You know what I mean? And, and then you would see your to-do list and you're like, oh, whew, that's a big to-do list. And then that just further overwhelms you. Um, so that was something I was really bad on. Like, why am I not being as productive as I want to be? So it took a lot of work on myself to, you know, redefine that relationship I had with productivity and efficiency and to-do list. Um, so if I didn't get something done, I would beat myself up like, oh, like why, like you had, <laughs> you chose to watch a Netflix show instead of doing this one little thing that would have taken you five, 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Um, and we all have those things. We all choose to do something instead of something else. Um, so it really became like, how do I master my day? And, uh, you know, success is really uh, everybody has their own term of success, but success is really just compounded habits that you build in to your day. And these habits over long term, you know, 66 days is the, uh, is a sweet spot for a habit to kick in. It, um, over the long term, you build whatever that success is to you, um, which is something I'm super passionate about. So, um, you know, with a mix of like redefining my relationship and with a mix of like, you know, time blocking, like, okay, I'm going to use this five minutes to do this. I'm going to start, I'm just going to do it for five minutes, whether it's, um, I like to re relate it to writing a book, like, okay, for five minutes, I'm going to write one, just one sentence of my book, right? Those five minutes are up and then you have a choice to uh you know keep going and like all right like next five minutes like, i'm gonna write a second sentence or you could or you could choose to 
you know what, for this five minutes, I'm going to just go on my phone and, you know, goof off for a little bit. And then after that five minutes is done, I'm going to pivot back to this. And, you know, those five minutes could be anywhere from five, 10, 15, 30 minutes, whatever works for you. Um, so that's something I really try to instill into my every day. Um, you know, whether it's like waking up, like, okay, I'm going to really start my mornings away from technology, away from my phone, get a good stretch in, be mindful of my routine of like, I'm going to make my coffee. And then once I give myself me time, I will dive into my emails and whatnot. So it's really establishing um, those days and like, you know, you running the day instead of the day running you, which is an age old uh, saying. Um, but we're all capable of doing it. It's just having that discipline and having that, like breaking it down into chunks. Well, that's a, um, that's a, that's a, you know, yes, it's an old adage, but it's a really good one to remember. Don't, don't let the day run you. But, but Joe, I, I, I want to just clear something up for our audience. You love what you do, don't you? Yeah. I, yeah. I love what I do. Absolutely. And it, that's what really fuels my fires. Like this, this thing, this thing being Rocky Clark, like that's burning inside me all day long. And that's, yeah, Carl to that, like, that's why I have these big to do lists because I want to get all that stuff done. But like, what can you focus on in that given time that will make everything else easier? You know what I mean? Um, again, there's another, there's another thing I've, I've come across these past couple of months, which really triggered this, you know, sort of new wheel to turn and that saying is so you have your to-do list you ask yourself what is the one thing i can do right now and in doing so will make everything else easier right so what is the one thing that will eliminate all these worries that you have and you know it's right now today, this week, this month, this year, you just break it down, reverse engineer it, um, and just focus on that one thing. And once that one thing is done, you take those five minutes to do it. It's like drinking a glass of water. It's like taking a deep breath. And it's like having the weight lifted off your shoulder. Um, and that's really just like shifted my mindset. And I've seen, um, I've seen it pay dividends in these past couple months. Well, that's great, Joe. Thank you. That, that's really wonderful advice. We, we really should get you up here to, to uh, run a seminar on that next year. We'll, we'll see what we can see what we can do. But it's, I just want to oh, throw in... music to my ears. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll drive I, I, right now. Yeah, come on, come on down. So, so, but interesting, I just, I just want to, I, I shouldn't personally interject, but I, I have to, because you mentioned that, that, um, getting down to write. I am actually writing a book right now and I have gotten to the point now where I have a timer and I have to write at least 30 minutes a day. And there, uh, last night at 1130, I set that timer and I wrote till midnight. Uh, and you know, that is, the, that is a really good way of doing things. So I, I just wanted to throw that in because you, you brought up the book writing. So Christine, let's, let's turn to you. And uh, when we talked, uh, what, what, what stuck in my mind uh, was again that moment of going into the world. And you, you mentioned that, and you actually already uh, spoke of that in your introduction, where, uh, you know, what, what, is it, what is this world? What, what does a buyer do? What does a, a, a person do? And then you're suddenly in the world learning about it. So what was that ex education for, if I'm now suddenly learning everything? Can you come back to that for me? Um, trying to think exactly what to say there. Um, you know, I think you, uh, to Alex's point, you kind of go, you know, you're in school, you're learning, you're learning all different aspects in TMD, you know, textile, merchandise, and design. So you kind of wonder, well, you know, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to be a buyer. Like what that really meant, I'm not really sure at the time uh, exactly, but you know, I knew I kind of wanted to go into the merchandising field and not really knowing what all the classes necessarily meant for me. And some I used more than others. And I know we discussed, um, I don't know the exact name of the, of the course, but it was like a textiles course. And like, I found that to be one of the most useful courses 
um, especially being in apparel, learning about yarns and uh, knits and wovens and polyran span and, you know, nylon span and just especially now I could almost imagine, you know, just having some new merchant assistants underneath me and them not being able to touch and feel the product. So when they're telling us it's a woven or a knit, like, you know, a lot of uh, what I learned in school actually in the very beginning definitely uh, was helpful. Um, but even as far as the buying perspective, I, I didn't even realize there were different avenues. I had no idea, um, you know, what a planner was. When I interned, I kind of mentioned, you know, I, I interned more in the, um, you know, for a couture fashion house. Well, amazing, you know, didn't necessarily tell me too much about buying. We were uh, working on a runway show and, you know, there's just so many different aspects of, um, of fashion and different careers you can take. So I think, you know, what I would tell um, someone still in school and, and looking for either an internship or their first job is, you know, what kind of excites you and kind of to what both the other uh, um, panel panelists said, it's, you know, really, what do you love? What are you really inter interested in, you know, getting to know a little bit more? And, you know, you can kind of divert your career as you kind of learn a little bit more. You know, I was in sales and while I enjoyed sales and I, lear I enjoyed learning about the product and selling it, I didn't also love the pressure of knowing that, um, oh, now I have to sell this and I'm not going to get commission for this. Like for me, that didn't like drive me um, as much. So when I went into buying, what I really realized is I love the accounting part. I love being accountable for, this is my beginning of month inventory. These are my receipts. I love uh, building relationships with people and schmoozing. Um, so, you know, I think the first, you know, especially five years of your career, it's really meant to kind of figure out like where your passion really, really kind of falls. And then, that's really what's going to make you successful in the long run. It's like, if you don't love what you do, I mean, anybody will tell you this is not an easy industry, um, especially if you're working, you know, I can just say from the New York City area, um, you know, it's, it's commutes, it, it, it's, you know, it's congested, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a passion. Um, you have to love it because it's, it's long hours, but, you know, in the end, it's, it's all worth it because this is what, you know, you love to do. And, you know, I always take, especially the buying route as a trade, right? Like no one can come can come in right now and just become a buyer that they don't know. And kind of like when you were saying lingo, as I always say, and my husband always kind of laughs, like, oh, we need to bring in more receipts. Oh, we got to push out receipts. And he's like, you know, there's just so much lingo as far as, um, you know, the DC and inventory and just like lingo that I just use, like it's second nature. And I think, you know, the first year when you're coming in, like you really have to be a sponge because there's just so much to learn that, um, you didn't even know existed. And um, I, I find it very exciting, but just, you know, uh, Alex was saying she's passionate about ladies apparel. And I kind of look back and it's like, well, if I knew now that the home industry was going to be amazing and people were really going to, you know, go into home and textiles and then maybe I should have gone into the, um, you know, I joke, but maybe go into the home. So I think it's like, for yourself, it's like, what are you passionate about? And then, you know, maybe thinking a little bit too, like, what is the up and coming thing? Like, yes, ladies apparel is great. You know, I love it, but we know that home is doing amazing right now. We know that outdoor textiles, um, you know, kids is amazing. So, you know, there's a lot of different like nuances of, uh, I think careers like are specific areas in the fashion that are booming right now. So, um, I would say to kind of, you know, think about the future of where retail is going and speak to some people in the industry, because there's just definitely things that I wouldn't have known unless, you know, I'm speaking to mentors and people who are, you know, doing, you know, similar uh, career paths. Well, let me just pick up on that before we, before we get to the adv advice round, uh, the, the booming future. Um, and you mentioned that, that, that the number of stores that, that, that are under, in your operation, it's going up by something like 10 or 12%. Mm -hmm. What's happening? And what does that mean for somebody coming into the industry? Um, well, listen, the off price, everybody can tell you, I mean, you look at the stock market, you look at what's going on, um, you know, coming from Bloomingdale's as amazing as that career was it, you know, people aren't spending as much as they used to spend, right? Nordstrom's, Bloomingdale's, Macy's, like really where they're booming and where their numbers are coming from is their off price sector, right? Like Nordstrom's Rack, um, Bloomingdale's back, um, Macy's Backstage. So for me and what I see right now in the retail industry, and there's going to be like different pockets, of course, that, you know, like um, that are doing well in different times. But for me, I really realize that the off price is really where it's booming. That's where the customer wants to spend her money. She feels like she gets a more diverse assortment for a lower AUR. Um, so 
the reason why Gabe's I think is growing right now is that we're finding a sector, we're finding a part of the country that um, Ross isn't in, that TJ's isn't in. So we're opening stores right now in Ohio in upstate New York. Um, my CEO came from TJ Maxx. So I think we really took a step back and realized, you know, being an off-pricer, like what do we do different than other off-pricers? So we have different sectors of our business that um, other off-pricers aren't in. We have a whole entire, not to get into too much details, like corporate, a corporate buy area, and they're buying stuff direct from Amazon, direct from Target, direct from Macy's. So we have um, kind of like our own little nuances in the off-price field. And I think that's something that's attracting the customer in. Um, if you hear one saying enough price is going to be like a treasure hunt philosophy. So, you know, we try to offer our customers something that, um, you know, they don't see everywhere. It's like, I'm going to come into the store today and like, am I going to be able to find those shoes again? Am I going to be able to find that top again? So um, that's kind of like in the last like 15 years, as far as off price, like kind of one of the true uh, statements that I hear, it's like, what is that treasure hunt? What is that person going to come in? Um, and I think that the big difference between just regular department store and off price is that like the average customer is coming into the store two to three times a month, which is not something that you usually see in um, a department store. So for me, it seems like um, in my realm, like off price is doing really well. And I think the customer is just asking for more. She wants different avenues to um, kind of shop. That's really, that's really interesting because, you know, in that time frame in the 10, 10, 15 year, 10, 15 years ago, you know, there, there was this whole idea, oh, brick and mortar is over. We're not going to, you know, it's, it's all done. It's all done. So it's a, it's a really interesting thing to see happen. So thanks. Thank you for, for, for describing that for us. So let's, uh, before we get to student questions, uh, let's take a, 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 another brief round. Now you've, you've all been very good so far about giving advice. And you've given very broad spectrum advice as well as very specific uh, down to the nitty gritty kind of action items. But uh, I'm going to do this anyway. Let's go, let's go back to the advice. And uh, what is the one most important thing? Here's a graduating student standing in front of you. What is the one most important thing from your point of view now looking back at your own journey that you would want to tell them that they may not have learned so far? What's that new realization that you wanna share? Alex, do you have, have a thought on that? Um, well, when you first graduate, and for me, I made this mistake because you're so anxious to get a job and you're just so excited and you'll take anything. It's important to ask questions before you're hired. It's important to research salaries, research benefits, make sure that you are in a spot where you're not getting underpaid. I mean, granted, we're not making like millions of dollars out of school, but you want to make sure that you are getting health insurance, that your, you know, your salary is up to standard of what is in the industry right now and just know your worth. I think it's important to, as you progress through the industry, I think people get really nervous about asking for a raise, asking for promotions. If you've put in the time and effort, I mean, granted, it's a time and a place. Like right now would probably not be the right time to ask for a raise because of given the circumstances of COVID, but it's important to stand up for yourself if you're really, if you've been in a company for a few years and you really put in the work and you haven't really been able to get a raise or a promotion, speak up for yourself um, and advocate for yourself because you're the, you are your biggest advocate. And if a company can't see that or if they can't provide that for you, then it's time to make a jump to a new company. Um, and it's really important to, you know, stand up for yourself and also to keep, um, keep up to date skills on Illustrator, Photoshop, everything is virtual. So it's really important if you're going into design to have strong Photoshop and Illustrator skills. Um, even on your, you know, if you have, you know, extra time on weekends, if you feel free to draw, it's so important to have those skills because they could ask you for updated sketches and they need it in 10 minutes and you have to just quickly put something together. So it's really imperative to have very strong computer skills. And uh, what else? Um, and also the last thing, to understand garment construction. I think when you're going into your first few years, you'll be doing a lot of tech packs. 
um, helping out the, you know, associate designers, you know, senior designers, understanding how a garment is constructed, um, whether that be, you know, a sweater or a knit or a woven. Um, it's important to kind of have a sense of lingo going into your first job. Sorry about that. Well, thank you, Alex. Excellent advice. Joe, what's your what's your gift to the graduating <laughs> student? Yeah, I would say that uh, it's really okay to be scared and anxious um, and maybe even a little pessimistic about the future. Um, I'm definitely optimistic, but um, you know, it's okay to feel those things. Um, cause it is, it is a, it isn't an intimidating landscape to sort of navigate as, you know, a, a young adult, a yo pro, um, young professional. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's really okay to, to feel those feelings. Um, I would say, you know, seek out those mentors, tap into your network, um, and your network being friends and family, you know, start there. Um, cause everybody knows somebody who could lead you in a direction where, you know, could take you in a million different ways. Um, but to that, I would say, um, Christine sort of, uh, alluded to this. I'm a firm believer that it's more important to learn what you don't like than it is to learn what you do like. Because by sorting through all that garbage, like all that, it's not garbage time, but um, you know, we've all taken jobs and we've all been in situations that feel sort of shitty and, and but they, they serve you in such a, um, in such a great way because you're like, all right, this doesn't really feel right to me. So let me, you know, it sort of pushes you more into the direction of where you want to go. So with that, um, which is sort of going to counter what Alex said, like, don't be afraid to take a job that isn't perfect coming out of school, you know, because everything is going to be a stepping stone to where you want to go. Um, and you will pick, like, I was in a really um, tough internship um, that was a little grueling, but I learned so much. And in those six months that I was there, it put me light years ahead of where um, I could have been in a different in a different setting. Um, so that's what I would say, like, don't be afraid mm -hmm. to to follow your dreams mm -hmm. by doing things that don't feel that good all the time. Yeah, and I, I can actually reconcile, before we get to Christine, I, I can reconcile the difference between what you said and what Alex said, in that, that um, there's, there's a long view and there's a short view, and both are equally important. Um, you get to be my age, you look back and you find it very hard to regret uh, decisions or, or, as Joe said, the, and, and I'll use his language, so this is not my language, uh, you, ha you don't regret the shitty job because it got you to where you are now. And so it's very hard to regret that. It was no fun while you were there, but you think, well, I wouldn't be here where I am now. And all of our guests today love their jobs. I love my job. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. So how can I regret having done what I, what I had to do? So Christine, what's, what will you like to advise? Um, you know, I think what both um, Joe and Alex said, you know, is, you know, is both true. Um, you know, listen, I inter I've interviewed lately a lot of uh, women and men at, at a school, you know, and I'm trying to think about what set them apart for me, bringing them to the next step step for the interview and not. And I want to say, you know, when you're coming into school, personally, I think, and I, you know, whether you want to hear it or not, it's like, it is the hardest to get a job, right? You're trying to differentiate yourself amongst 
a, a large group of people who basically, for the most part, have the same have have a similar background. Most people uh, interned in, in fashion once, you know, when uh, majored in, you know, either a text a textile. So you're trying to see like during your interview, like what is going to set you aside. And I think the one thing that I truly like to see is a personality. Like, don't be afraid to, um, you know, don't be so rigid, you know. I think do the research if you're interviewing, like do the research, like what is Gabe's, like what do you stand for? Because I know, you know, as somebody interviewing, it's like, I want to know that you did some research that you care about where we work or where you want to work. You're not just trying to get it, you know, you're not just trying to get any job. So I would say, you know, be knowledgeable on, on where you're interviewing, um, you know, show your personality, say, okay, you know, this is, this is, you know, as everybody kind of said, a tough industry in a way, we want to know that when you come in, like you're going to be able to ask questions that you're going to, you know, be a sponge and suck, you know, and, and um, you know, soak up uh, the information we're telling you. So I always enjoy seeing somebody who I feel like, yeah, you know, I'm not so much seeing you as your merchant assistant. I want to see if I can kind of see in that 20 minutes that I'm speaking with you that you're going to be able to become a buyer one day, that you have uh, passion in what you do, that you're excited. I mean, I love when I see excitement um, from the from anyone interviewing that, wow, they, they, they really want this. Um, and I don't think it's, you should be embarrassed to say that, you know, this is something I really want. Um, you know, I'm interested in any way I can get into this company. Um, so that would kind of be like my advice as far as like interviewing and, and starting out. Um, but while we all want the ideal job, you know, there's only so many of, of those out there, you know, right now. So um, I would just, as far as internships, like if you really want to be in, I'll just speak to the buying. If you want to be in buying, a lot of the internships, like hire you after. So kind of learn about if you have a choice in internships. Is this just like a one-off, like I'm the one person interning? Or is this a real internship program where they hire back? Um, I know at Ross, they hire 90% back of the intern. So, you know, I would say if you have the opportunity to interview, um, to intern at a, at a good company, like I would strongly suggest that that's not something I did. I interned in, in a smaller company, which, you know, also had its benefits. But um, if you can get somewhere where, you know, they do have a higher back rate, I mean, that's just an easier, I guess, platform you to start your career off in. But everything, every job gets you somewhere. And I think what Joe said, it's like, I didn't love my first job, but guess what? It got me to have enough experience to get into the buying um, aspect that I wanted to go into. So if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have got where I was. If I didn't have the executive training program from Bloomingdale's, I probably wouldn't have got into Ross. So, you know, every job that you do gets you to the next level and, um, you know, keep the mentors. The reason I got this job, it was my old boss, who's now the CMO. So, you know, what you do now will, will help you in every part of your career go forward. And that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, you just veered toward it there. Don't burn bridges. No. Don't burn bridges. That's a really important bit of advice. And I wanna come back again to that point that Alex made that you just reiterated. Standing up for yourself is extraordinarily important. And we're going through a time in our culture where the female voice is now being looked at in a way that it wasn't when I was coming up, for example. And um, you have to understand that standing up for yourself is more than just making sure you're okay. It's about making sure that everybody around you is okay. And, and people respect that. It's, it's not a liability for you to ask for things. It's not a liability for you to seek advice or to say, hang on a sec, I've got a point to make. And so that's a very important point that, that, that is coming out of this too. All right, so let's open for questions. Any questions for our guests? If you would uh, just, anybody can just unmute and dive in. Let's, we have about 10 minutes and I have uh, four percent left on my battery. So let's let's see where we are. Don't be bashful here. No, this is a, you got to use. Okay, we just heard about speaking up. So let's get some questions here. What what's an important question to ask? If you can think of a good question, ten other people on this call are thinking about it too. So be the person to break that ice. Ask the question. I have a question. Good. Um, so I've been applying through LinkedIn and I've noticed that LinkedIn is very unpersonalized, but like a whole part of me is like being personable with other people. How do you like suggest to like help with that? 
Who wants to take that? I'll jump in on the LinkedIn. Um, I, you know, I don't think to be bashful for what you want. Um, we just were hiring merchant assistants, which, you know, my company is basically like starting out for an assistant buyer role. And my HR director actually emailed me and said, these three people actually emailed me directly. They went in, they found out who the HR director was and emailed her directly. She said, so I want to give an extra effort and an extra eye. So out of 300 applicants, those three came to the top because she felt like they went above and beyond just applying through the LinkedIn. So, you know, that would be my advice that if it's something you're really interested in, you know, there are a plethora of people interviewing, make yourself kind of, um, you know, no. And so try to find a different avenue to get to that person too. So, well, I think LinkedIn is a great way, way, way to start and you might end up getting a job just through that. I would say if it's somewhere you can do a little more research and uh, email somebody directly, I think it does go a long way. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Anyone else? Alex, you want to jump in on that? Joe? Um, you can also go to the company website too. There also is probably a career section of the site as well, but like um, Christine said, the personal messages are definitely important um, and trying to like making you stand out from the rest. Cause I know that, you know, I, I sat through a style careers seminar like mid COVID and some companies were getting like thousands of applicants for certain positions, especially with, you know, all the furloughs that were going on. So it's important to stand out in some sort of sense, whether that be, you know, personal note or, you know, directing your portfolio to that HR person, uh, like right off the bat. So mm -hmm. um, there's definitely different ways to navigate for sure. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another question, please. Anyone? Maybe not even a question, like what, what, yeah, are, what are you nervous? Yeah, a thought, like what are you thought, nervous uh, about? What are you scared of? What are you excited about? What's yeah. something that you're interested in that you don't really know much about? While you're thinking about that, let me add one thought about the thousands of applicants and you. Uh, it's a really uh, interesting thing to think about. How do people choose from a thousand applicants? Well, the first thing they do is a really quick triage. And so any little glitch puts you in the discard pile. Things like spelling mistakes on an application, not signing something you're supposed to sign, uh, not putting your phone number where you're supposed to put your phone number. Boom, you're in the out pile because they got to get through that first 500, right? So be very careful about that. Read all the instructions. Read what they're asking you to tell them. Okay. So anybody have something for us? Also for like when you're applying as well, it's also good to doctor up your resume and make it like if you're looking at the job description, make your like, you know, former, you know, work experience similar to what that job description is um, so that the verbiage is runs parallel to what they want. So you're kind of hitting all of the notes that they're looking for um, and not to get too wordy on your resume, like they don't need paragraphs, but generalized, you know, summaries of, you know, those specific um, tasks that they're looking for. Yes, that's good advice, thank you. Well, we're at, uh, we're at the 925 mark, and uh, I believe there's another session starting at 930. So let's give everybody a chance to uh, refill their coffee cups and head into the next session. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Christine. This has been extremely valuable, very educational, and we really appreciate your um, help. We appreciate your sincerity. And uh, we hope to see you back soon. And uh, I, I'm sure our guests have been absolutely thrilled by this. And um, I, you're all on LinkedIn. And so uh, they know where to find you. And, uh, and I know from speaking with all of you that you are very open to, um, to receiving. And feel uh, free to send messages. like sketches, 
if you want advice about how sketches look, advice about your resume, you know, you know, any sort of advice, you know, I'm happy to help. Um, and, uh, you know, just check me out on LinkedIn. And it's important to have mentors and people that have gone through the process because it can be a little overwhelming. And myself, Joe and Christine, we're happy to help um, with anything you guys need. Absolutely. Yeah, I just put my email in the chat here. Um, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, if it's if you want to ask a side question on the side, like I'd be more than happy to, you know, answer on um, whether it's email, if you guys want to set up a call. Um, you know, we were in your shoes once. And I mean, I, I graduated in 2016. So I'm really not too far down the road uh, from where you guys are. So I know how you're feeling. Um, so again, like use us as part of your network use us as mentors um because you know we're we're uri alums so mm. um great thank you and don't just be like you guys and don't be ashamed like or embarrassed to reach out it's all about networking and it's all about who you know and that's how people you know really get themselves in the door um you know having a friend of a friend that's you know the vp of you know gap that will get you in the door, but it's a matter of how you take that and you know what you do with it. That's how we'll, you'll get the job, but it's all about connections. Okay. Christine, last words? Um, no, I just agree with everything everybody else said. You know, at this point to get into the door, you know, use your connections. I, I honestly do believe that's, you know, a big part of it. Um, I wish it wasn't, but that's really, you know, it's not going to get you the job, but you know what? You just want to get the interview and then it, it's on you. So um, I would use any avenue you can. Um, I'm open for any questions you might have. If there's a, a company you don't know much about and you think I might know about them, um, you know, it, it's a it's a big industry, but it's also a small industry. I've kind of realized that over the last 20 years. So um, everybody That's knows it. somebody who knows somebody. So, uh, you know, I would use whatever, whoever you can to, you know, help you get to where you were. And if you don't really know and you have questions, I mean, the three of us are free. I'm sure there's other people also available to answer. Okay, thank you. That's that's really great. We really appreciate that. We really appreciate what you're doing for our students. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. And, thank you. Um, thank you best so much. Wish, best wishes to everybody. Thank Take you. care, all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.